So, uh, yeah, today the talk is actually not as much about file systems or the ext4 file system in specific as much as it is about making programs, specifically the operating system, scale to a large number of CPUs. And in some ways, this is an old story. Um, it's, uh, you know, something we've certainly done before, but uh, we did it for a while and then we stopped. And it's been long enough that I thought it might be good to do a little quick refresher course. So we're going to set the Wayback Machine. Uh, and we're going to set it for the year 2001. Um, so 2001 was a good year. Uh, it was the time of Linux 2.4. Uh, IBM had just announced uh, that it was going to invest a billion dollars into Linux. Um, and, you know, Linux had SMP, but depending on who you talked to and what the workload was, um, a lot of people basically said, yeah, you know, it didn't really scale all that well. You know, four CPUs, maybe, hardly, you know, eh. Um, and so, you know, what does that mean? Why does this matter? Why should you care? Um, so let's talk a little bit about SMP scalability, um, which is, you know, what do you do when one CPU just isn't enough? Uh, and this was actually a lot more important uh, back in, uh, you know, the early 2000s because CPUs were just simply not as powerful as they used to be, uh, as, as they are today. Um, you know, that was nine years ago, so that's about six doublings of Moore's Law. Um, and so at the time, uh, if you look at the late 90s, the early, uh, 2000, 2001, people would actually buy um, and pay top dollar uh, for machines that had 4, 8, 16, 32 Pentiums um, put together in a box. Sequent sold an awful lot of those. Um, and those machines were really, really expensive. Um, and why is that the case? And the answer is that coordinating a large number of sockets um, into which you're going to be plugging in actual CPU chips um, is really expensive. Uh, what if you have two CPUs that want to talk to the same memory location? They either are both writing the same memory location, one is reading, the other one's writing. Um, CPUs generally have caches, so there will be some cache on the actual CPU socket itself. Uh, and if another CPU has written to it, how do you make sure that cache coherency is maintained? Right? Typically, you either have to have one CPU telling all the other CPUs, I just modified this memory location. If you have this memory location in your cache, get rid of it. Um, or you can have CPUs uh, and caching systems that basically do what you call cache snooping, which is to say they listen on the bus and they see write transactions go by um, modifying particular memory location and they have that in their cache, they have to delete it. This is an awful lot of extra machinery that you need to put in there. Um, and in fact, this interconnect, how do you actually make the CPUs talk to each other and the CPUs talking to memory uh, is critically, critically important. Uh, because if that interconnect isn't fast, um, then your whole system won't be very fast. And this is true for SMP machines, but it's also true for those of you who might have tried to build clusters, right? The interconnect fabric between individual machines in a cluster is very often the thing that will prevent a cluster from being as effective as you think it is. Uh, now, there were various people that would try various things. I called cheating here on the slide. That's not entirely fair because the answer is if the machine is too expensive for what you want to do, you will simply not do it or find some other way of doing it. Um, and so one thing that you can do to try to make things cheaper is by accepting the fact that some memory locations will be much easier to access from some CPUs than other CPUs. So it may, be, it may only take one quantum of time to access the memory location if it's connected to one CPU. But if it's on another CPU that's far off, maybe it's 10 times that quantum of time in order to actually access it. Well, if that's true, then your operating system had better know what memory locations are close to which CPUs so you can actually put things in the right place. Uh, and that's actually pretty complicated. It's really hard to get right. Um, Sequin did a lot of work in that area, and then later on SGI with their Altix machines 
um, were even more extreme, right? I mean, they would have machines with 10,024 CPUs, and if you needed to access something and you were on the wrong CPU, you would wait a very, very long time. Uh, so, you know, that's NUMA. Uh, but the bottom line with all of that is if you have a machine with four CPU sockets, uh, it's going to cost a lot more than just simply having four single CPU machines. Um, and there's a funny thing, which is once you do that, customers get really, really irritated um, when they spend a huge amount of money for this machine that says it has, you know, for 16 CPUs right on the box, and they don't actually get all the CPU power that they actually paid for, right? So, you know, uh, and very often what will happen is you'll have some clueless salesperson who will sell, you know, a 32 socket machine that is heavily NUMA uh, to some big important customer without asking the customer what do they actually plan to use the box for. Uh, and then they buy it, and then it doesn't work as, uh, expected, uh, and, you know, the customer doesn't blame himself. The customer will not blame his application programmers. The customer will, will blame the salesperson who actually sold him what he considers, you know, POS, right? So, um, what do you do? Well, you know, how do we actually measure scalability? Well, the first thing is we're going to run one or more benchmarks uh, on a single CPU system. And there are a large number of benchmarks. Uh, these were some of the ones that were used uh, in the early 2000s, 2001, 2002, 2003. Uh, and this is actually a really important thing, which is that different benchmarks measure different things. Um, some benchmarks are actually more about the Java virtual machine and how the Java virtual machine talks to the kernel than anything else. Example, Volano Mark. Um, others are, you know, really stressing the networks. Some will be stressing the file system. Uh, and so scalability as a single number means very little. What works really well for one particular program, one particular benchmark, is going to really, really suck on some other one. But the basic thing you're going to do is you're going to take some benchmark, you're going to run it on a reference system that has one CPU, or maybe you boot a single CPU, uh, uh, operating system image, you run it there. Now you run the exact same benchmarks uh, on, an, on a system with, say, for the sake of argument, eight CPUs. And, uh, you know, we'll sort of divide the score that you have on, uh, actually, I got this backwards, uh, on eight CPUs by the score that you have on one CPU. Uh, so reverse that up on the slides. Um, and that's what you will actually get is some sort of scalability for a particular kernel version, for a particular benchmark, and you might say, yeah, well, you know, so this particular version, it scales 12 out of 16 CPUs on the Fublabs benchmark, right? And all of that is important. If you don't mention the benchmark, if you don't mention that, you know, it, it just really doesn't make much sense. So scalability is really hard, especially if you, de it depends on which workload, what benchmarks. Um, but on some benchmarks, just simply 12 out of 16 CPUs might be considered really good, right? I mean, you know, that might be considered excellent. But think about what that means. That means we're only using 75% of the theoretical power of the machine um, for a machine that costs way more than 16 times, you know, a single CPU server. And, and again, a lot of people aren't really expecting that. Um, and if you actually go back to the early 2000s, on a lot of these benchmarks, uh, Linux was barely scaling to four CPUs, by which I mean, you know, there was well less than uh, two, in some cases, two, two or three times a single CPU benchmarks, and there were some benchmarks where it was actually slower to run it on a four CPU system than a single CPU system, which is what you call negative scalability, which is really unfortunate. Um, and so, in 2001, there was an effort called the Linux Scalability Effort. Uh, it was spearheaded um, by folks at uh, IBM's Linux Technology Center, but there were a lot of other companies involved. Uh, SGI, Intel, VA Linux, University of Michigan City, I think HP may have uh, participated a little bit. Uh, and they did weekly conference calls. Uh, the minutes of those are still up on uh, lse.sourceforge.net if you actually want to 
go see them all. They're, they're actually all archived there. Um, and this is sort of the key methodology of how you actually uh, improve uh, scalability for a system. Uh, and again, it's been a while since we've actually done this in a concentrated way. So I think it's good to kind of remind people of, you know, you can use a regimented approach to actually make progress very quickly. Um, but what, what they actually did, you know, nine years ago, was they had regular benchmarks um, that were done by a performance team. And they would basically run the same benchmarks every week, maybe every month, and you would actually get progress that you could actually chart up on a chart and you could see how well you were doing. Because every change that you make would change the bottlenecks and would change what, what, what you actually needed to do next. And if you don't actually have the feedback, you don't know what you actually need to improve next. Um, and I'll give you a demonstration of that uh, in a little bit. So you take a look at the uh, profiles that you get, the lock profiles, CPU utilization, uh, and then you find and fix the bottlenecks you have. Uh, and then you just simply do that again and again and again until you fix you know, all of the really embarrassing ones. Um, and so between 2001 to, oh, I don't know, mid-2003, um, this was actually being done very, very regularly. Uh, and then people declared victory and everyone went home. That's not entirely true. SGI kept on doing their Altic systems, but those were actually really specialized. And again, you couldn't take some arbitrary program, put it on a 1024 CPU Altix machine or 256 CPU Altix machine and expect it to actually perform 200 times better or 1,000 times better, right? It was actually very, very specialized. But for the rest of the world, they just sort of said, yeah, you know, it's good enough. Uh, and what did that mean? It was good. It was definitely really, really good. It certainly wasn't perfect. Um, you know, we were getting pretty, pretty good on eight CPUs. You could actually use most of the uh, CPU power. On 16 CPUs, it wasn't, you know, as great, but it was still decent. And it was an acceptable number of CPUs on 32 machines. Now again, all of this has to be qualified by the benchmarks. There are some benchmarks that do really well. Uh, how many of you remember Anton Blanchard demonstrating a kernel compile in 30 seconds on, you know, a cold system? Yeah, some of you remember that, right? That was a case of a benchmark that's actually really easy to do because you can distribute the work across a large number of machines. Other benchmarks, you're not going to, you know, be that good. Uh, and so it might be interesting, some of you may say, why did people stop? We certainly could have done better. Uh, and I think the answer is that Linux did really, really well on a certain segment of market, not necessarily as well on some of the other platforms, right? So on x86, uh, it did really well on the LAMP stack, uh, web servers, uh, scale out. Um, but it turns out, funny thing, at least back then in the early 2000s, people who were going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars um, on high-end Spark or power servers tended to prefer the other legacy operating systems, um, at least in the enterprise market. And a lot of that may, you know, there are a lot of reasons why. Uh, some of it was just the fact that they had a whole bunch of system administrators who were used to how Solaris or how AIX worked. Uh, in some cases, it was because there were certain enterprise features like multipathing that weren't really ready for prime time back then. So if you're going to have this really high-end system, you're probably going to have a really high-end I.O. infrastructure. Um, but for a variety of reasons, um, they weren't necessarily buying the really, really large number of CPUs uh, and putting Linux on it. Um, and at least at that time, very few x86 servers had more than 8 to 16 CPUs. Um, just because if you had more, you generally tend to use other operating systems, and so there was less need to actually scale to that. Um, and, you know, as I've already said, Linux really is sort of the king of scale-out computing, where you have a large number of servers all working together. And for a lot of problems, that may make a lot of sense. Uh, if you're running some sort of, you know, web service, uh, it may be that the best thing to do is to have a whole bunch of web servers, uh, and they will do the front-end work talking to an individual uh, you know, web browser or you know, a whole bunch of web browsers, but then each of the web servers then talk to a single Jigundo database. And that one gigantic database 
Maybe it runs Linux, but it could just as easily run some other big Unix system, and that will be really, really big. And all the small front end systems would be Linux. Database might be Linux, might be something else. Um, and so I am now going to dismiss four to five years of history with a wave of a single slide uh, and say, yeah, you know, that was sort of the end of the scalability story. Uh, and that's, you know, highly simplified. Um, but it's also the case that that's a very, very long time in an industry where, you know, I don't remember who said it, but it's true, you know, in the computer world, two years is infinity. Right, um, and so four years is a really long time. A lot of people have sort of, you know, sort of said, "Oh yeah, well, Linux scales large number of CPUs, we're good. We don't need to worry about it." Um, now, during that time, we also saw Linux uh, getting used a whole lot more in the embedded and mobile markets, and those were traditionally smaller CPUs. You generally didn't have, uh, you know, SMP on the embedded and mobile market. That's starting to change by the way. Uh, and then an interesting thing started happening about, oh, two, three years ago, which is CPU frequency stopped doubling every 12 to 18 months. Uh, we sort of hit a wall as far as CPU doubling. And so now what's happening is people are actually putting more cores uh, on a particular uh, socket. Um, so, you know, you've got two, you've got four, eight cores on a socket. Uh, and these machines are really becoming mainstream. You know, I actually have uh, at my desktop at work a dual socket hex core uh, system. You know, so that's 12 cores total. And it really wasn't actually all that expensive, right? I mean, th these are systems that you can buy today without, you know, spending, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so, you know, here we are in 2011, uh, and scalability has started to matter again. Right? You know, if you've got four sockets, uh, ser a server system with four sockets on it, it really isn't that rare. That'll be, you know, a bit more expensive than a single server uh, blade, say. Um, but they're certainly, you know, out there. And if you've got eight cores on a socket, and there are more coming, that's 32 CPUs as a common configuration for Linux. Um, and so this is time now for kernel programmers to rediscover the lessons of scalability tuning, uh, and it's also time for the application programmers to start thinking really hard about multi-threaded programming for those of you who haven't started doing it already. Um, because uh, last year, Intel uh, has actually released demonstration systems. I don't think they're available in common use quite yet, but 32 cores on a system, a Knight's Ferry. Um, you know, sound good to you? Sounds great to me. Can we actually use it? That's the interesting question. Um, and so now let's actually talk uh, about file systems. Uh, EXT3 had for a long time what I called good enough scalability. Uh, because the dirty little secret is that most workloads, certainly most x86 workloads, um, don't really stress the file system. At least historically, you ended up hitting other bottlenecks first. Um, now, a lot of those bottlenecks are getting knocked out of the way, so it's starting to become a lot more obvious. And, of course, hardware is changing. Um, the other thing that happened, in particular in the uh, enterprise market, was the few machines that tended to be really, really big um, iron machines were database systems. And enterprise databases generally tended to use direct I.O. to files that were already pre-allocated. You know, so this is something Oracle does, something DB2 does. Turns out ext 3 is really, really good for that case. Sucks in almost every other case, but in that one case, it actually was pretty good, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, now it was certainly true that ext 3 didn't do well if you actually did head-to-head -head benchmark competitions against other file systems, right? And this is an understatement. There's some really, really good file systems out there that do a much better job if you actually have a very file system intensive workload. Um, but the funny thing was, a lot of system administrators really didn't care, right? Because for their workload, it wasn't the bottleneck. Um, ext 3 worked. Um, and in some ways, the fact that ext 3 was a more simpler file system meant that uh, it was easier for them to fix it if things went wrong. And, you know, it had fairly good tools for automatically fixing it, for, you know, looking at it with debugfs. Funny thing, those things are actually also important 
not just performance. Um, but, you know, EXT4 has come along and it's uh, long past time for us to actually worry about scalability uh, on EXT4. And so this story begins uh, in April 2010. Uh, and the uh, IBM real-time team was trying to improve file system performance when config RT preempt was actually enabled. And they noticed a little minor problem when they ran the dbench benchmark. Um, which was they were spending an awful lot of time on spin locks. Uh, in fact, they were spending 90% of their time <laughs> on spin locks. Uh, and uh, you can see where. Uh, roughly two-thirds of that time was in JBD journal start, and about a third of the time was in JBD journal stop. Um, and those routines uh, get used an awful lot. Um, now, Fortunately, it was actually pretty easy to figure out what's going on. Uh, not only did I know what was going on, but also, fortunately, the stuff is actually relatively well documented in the header files. Safety tip. If you're going to do multi-threaded programs uh, and you're going to be using lots of locks, document two things really well. For each field in the data structure that might have concurrent access, document which lock is supposed to protect that field. <laughs> And also, document the locking order, right? What order do you have to take locks if you're doing multiple locks? There are a lot of locks in the kernel where this is not obvious. Um, and you basically have to stare at the code and hope you get it right when you modify said code. But if it's well documented, it's actually pretty easy. So, you know, you look at the header file and you say, okay, there's a J state lock. It protects fields in the journal super block and the T handle lock that protects uh, fields in the transaction handle structure. Uh, and as it turns out, JBD journal start and JBD journal stop were taking both locks for every single transaction. Now, what are these things actually used for? Well, it turns out that um, file system transactions are, well, transactions in general are expensive. Um, and so what uh, many file systems will do is they want to do journaling. Um, so what they'll do is they will group multiple file system operations into a single giant transaction, because if you were going to do a transaction for every single tiny operation, every single stat, every, every single chmod, every single unlink, uh, it would get really, really expensive. So you group them together, and every five seconds you do a commit, uh, and you might do it sooner if uh, the program explicitly requests it via an f-sync, or the transaction starts getting full, or the journal starts getting full. Um, and then every single one of these file system operations, whether it's a chmod or a chown or, um, or an unlink, um, are bracketed by a journal start and a journal stop call. Um, and in the journal start call, you pass in the worst case estimate of how many blocks you're going to modify so you can um, check to see whether or not a new transaction needs to be started. And in order to check to see whether or not there's enough space for this new transaction or this new operation, uh, in that transaction, you have to check and see how many blocks have been modified for a particular transaction, as well as how many free credits are still available in the journal, which is why we have to take the locks. Um, so the first thing that I noticed very, very quickly was, well, gee, JBD journal stop was taking this JState lock spin lock, but I couldn't find any um, field that it was actually using that was actually protected by the lock, right? And this was helped a lot by the fact that everything was well documented about what was actually taking what. And it's like, oh, well, if we're not actually, if we don't actually need the lock, uh, we should just remove it. Uh, and just simply removing that lock, um, I couldn't find the numbers, but uh, the real-time team people were really happy. That, that made a huge difference for them right there, just simply removing a lock uh, that wasn't necessary. Um, and then Eric Whitney from HP said, well, you know, I have this really nice, big 48-core AMD system with hardware RAID. Let me do some benchmarks for you. Um, and he just sort of, you know, offered it. Uh, and so this was the results of that first patch. Um, and you can see here the dark green is ext4. The light green here is with the patch uh, applied. And the blue bar is XFS just so we can see you know, XFS a lot better than uh, EXT3 or EXT4. And you can see here, though, that just simply removing a lock that we didn't need, right? We just simply took the lock, 
release the lock. This was literally something like a four line change because I was removing it in a couple of places and there were some exit paths. But effectively, just simply removing a lock we didn't need, happened to be a lock we used a lot, um, caused an immediate throughput improvement once we started putting 48 threads on 48 cores. Really helped a lot. And you can see it also reduced CPU utilization, um, but not by a huge amount, but it definitely did help. Uh, this, was with, this was with large file creates. Um, with with uh, random writes, we saw a similar uh, improvement. Uh, with random writes, it turns out XFS isn't quite stomping on ext4 quite so much, but uh, it's still, again, an improvement. Um, so the next question was, well, can we do better? Well, one of the things that uh, Eric also did for us was he used a very much more powerful um, profiling tool than a simple CPU profile. He actually used LockSat. Um, and so this is how you actually turn LockSat on, on, on and off. Pretty simple. I'm not going to dwell on that. This is what LockSat results actually look like. Um, which is really, really hard to read. This is an eye chart. Um, so I'm going to be, for the rest of the presentations, showing you the numbers in a somewhat easier to understand form, um, but understand that I've reformatted it, right? This is not what you'll actually see. The previous slide is what Lockstat output actually looks like. Um, and so for each lock, ordered in terms of which lock is actually hurting the most, um, we can see uh, contention bounces, that's the number of times that you actually had lock contention across two different CPUs. Um, so the lock was really expensive because it had to bounce back and forth. Uh, the number of lock contentions in general, um, wait time max, uh, which is the amount of time in total that we spent waiting for it in nanoseconds. Um, you can see that number is just way bigger than every other number uh, on here. Uh, oh, this is, sorry, this is the maximum and then wait time total is the total amount of time that we waited for it on that particular benchmark. Uh, and then we have acquisitions, how many times we actually grab the lock. Hold time is how long you actually hold a particular lock. Uh, and you can see that even though the lock was only held for a certain amount of time, when you take into account how much time you needed to actually take the lock, that can be a hell of a lot more than the time that you actually hold the lock. Right? So this is just a quick um, sort of look at how you might interpret lockstat uh, numbers. Uh, and then there's details for each of the locks showing here how many times a particular uh, lock contention was caused by a particular function. So the function start this handle was responsible for the bulk of the times when we tried to grab the lock and there was contention, uh, followed by uh, JBD log start commit. And then the bottom set of numbers are what functions were holding the lock at the time of lock contention. And again, you can see that the two lists will generally be, uh, have a lot in common. Start this handle um, is certainly a huge part of the guilty party, uh, as is log start commit. And then you can see for T handled lock, a similar set of details. And we again see the journal start and stop uh, are a big part of that because I removed it from J. Uh, from journal stop, uh, I removed the J state lock from journal stop, but the T handle lock was still there, so it's uh, really high up there. So what do we do? What do we do? Um, so the first thing uh, that we did after he gave me that report is like, okay, there are a huge number of places where we were just simply taking that result to increment a single statistic um, or a single credit variable, and in fact, there was no need to actually have an atomic modification across multiple fields uh, in the data structure, which means we could just simply use an atomic T uh, instead of actually taking a lock and then modifying it. Um, one of the open questions is right now, we always do the statistics gathering, even though it's actually pretty rare that people actually query the statistics. So maybe we should take that out. Uh, and then there's the accounting information. Uh, and then, the other uh, trick that we used was, it turns out that in most of the places, we only needed to protect the data for, for, for reading purposes, but we could actually allow multiple uh, CPUs to actually read at the same time. It was rare that we actually needed to modify it. Um, so we could use a read-write lock. Um, and those two uh, changes in total meant that we could now start and stop handles 
uh, in parallel. So you can now, except for what do you do on a commit, uh, we're fine, and you can see what a huge difference that actually made here. Uh, again, the dark, dark green is ext4, the light green is the no journal, and uh, this uh, hash mark here is the no journal mode, which was actually done by accident um, by Eric, but then I said, well, that's actually an interesting result, so let's keep that. Uh, and again, you can see that makes a huge difference uh, for the amount of CPU that's used, and uh, this is for random writes. The lock stat numbers show something which is really cool, which is we are now no, the top lock uh, on uh, that's actually causing problems is no longer the journal lock. It's actually the block IO queue lock. Um, and you can see here that uh, for the block IO queue lock, uh, it's because we're doing lots and lots of make requests. Um, so yeah, in the J state lock, you can see we're still needing it, but it's no longer the primary problem. Uh, so that's really good, right? It means that it's no longer JBD2, which is the bottleneck. Um, it's the, uh, uh, it's the, the block IO layer. And it turns out what's left is actually going to be really hard to fix because um, what's left is actually something which is kind of unavoidable, which is when the transaction starts getting full, we finally have to say, okay, it's time to stop this transaction and start a new one. Now, in order to do that, we have to wait for all the other pending micro operations, the handles, to complete. And that's sort of unavoidable. So there's a certain amount of waiting for the other handles to happen that you just kind of have to do. Um, fixing it might be possible, but you know, it's, no, it's going to be quite hard. The real problem now is how ext4 is uh, submitting its uh, blocks uh, to the block I.O. layer. Uh, and to cut to the chase, this is the problem, uh, which is our buffered writes, we're basically sending writes 4K at a time to the B.I.O. layer. Um, and uh, reads were actually done right. So the reads actually use mpage read pages. Um, but because some of the time when we're actually writing the blocks, we also had to allocate the blocks, uh, we couldn't use the mpage functions. And we did our own stupid thing, which was just simply submit each 4K block at a time. Um, now, this didn't matter as far as the disk was concerned, because the block Q layer would actually merge these 4K writes back together. Um, but this wastes a whole bunch of CPU and a lot of locking overhead, as you've seen. Um, there are other things that it does which are kind of nasty. It makes block traces really large, um, and it makes uh, IO statistics confusing because depending on which device you look at, the numbers can either be before we've actually merged them together or after we've merged them all together. Um, and it's just kind of a waste, right? We spend all of this time, uh, you know, assembling things together so we can em emit a single contiguous write. And what's the first thing we do? It's like a Jinsu knife. We just cut it up into little tiny writes and squirt them through. Uh, so that was kind of uh, annoying. Um, so I'm kind of running out of time. I want to leave time for questions. So moving a little quickly here. Uh, so what we did was uh, I wrote a drop-in replacement for block write full page that would actually accumulate writes to pages in a, in a function, in, in a data structure. And then when we were done, we would call IO submit. That would just send, send it all down to the block IO layer um, as a single write. Um, required a massive uh, overhaul and cleanup of the write submission path, or at least half of it. Um, but that's okay, it desperately needed the cleanup anyway. Um, and here are the net results. Uh, you can see here that uh, on large file creates, uh, we this time actually did it with the journal and without the journal. Uh, and you can see that once the uh, patch was applied, that's the crosshatch line, uh, it makes a huge difference uh, as far as throughput is concerned. Uh, and then the CPU utilization numbers are a little hinky because we're using more CPU, but that's because we're actually sending more writes. Um, and if you look at random writes, uh, the, one of the interesting things is that uh, you can see here there's uh, ext4, the patches don't make as much of a difference. ext3 is down here, um, but on some of these workloads on this particular hardware configuration, for the first time we were actually beating XFS, which was amazing to me. It was not something I anticipated. 
Uh, here EXT, uh, XFS has done some more improvements since then, so I, um, I don't think we're beating them now, but that's, that's uh, what we're at. Um, unfortunately, the work is not quite uh, done because uh, someone found a bug uh, when you're using DMCrypt, which is a very slow device, um, and Postgres, and we got data corruption. So there's a race that um, we still need to actually uh, fix. Um, so, um, but we're working on it. I'm, I'm actually pretty sure we will be able to fix it. Um, for now, that last enhancement's been disabled by default because it can cause data corruption. Um, pretty rare. I actually was running for a while and didn't notice it. Um, but you can turn it on again with a mount option so we can actually test and try to fix it. Uh, now all we have to do is find the bug. Um, so just to sum up real quickly, um, I hope this talk is a good way of reminding us all that we really do need to pay attention to SMP scalability again. Uh, and that does mean thinking really hard about multi-threading, um, which is a lot harder to debug, lots of potential for race conditions like that last bug showed, and performance tuning is actually kind of tricky. Um, and some of the techniques that we actually use, such as atomic variables, read-write locking, um, batching work together. Um, one interesting thing to note is a lot of what I've talked about in this talk also applies to user space as well. Um, you can actually use Atomic T if you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of portability because you have to end up having to import headers that uh, do assembly language. Uh, uh, Pthread mutexes are actually pretty fast because we've actually done that a lot. Uh, one obvious thing is don't use spin locks because they uh, don't work well uh, in user space code. Uh, and two final things that I want to actually uh, point out, um, I actually found out about them while I was researching for this talk, um, is Valgrind has a new uh, tool uh, in its latest, uh, if you look at the latest version called DRD, that will automatically detect data races um, in user space code. So if you're writing multi-threaded code, uh, definitely take a look at that. Uh, and Lenart has a tool called MUTrace, which does stuff a lot like Lockstat, um, but for mutexes in user space code. And again, if, you, if you're writing user space code and you want to try to do performance tuning, um, MUTrace might be a good tool to actually look at. Um, so with that, um, thank you, and uh, hopefully we'll have time for a few questions. Uh, yeah, I have a question, uh, Ted. Is um, using all the atomic variable for your stats? Did that have a significant impact on single thread performance? Um, so, if you actually look at the numbers, uh, not really. Um, now, like I said, I, I'm seriously thinking about turning them off by default, since most of the time people don't look at the stats anyway. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Would that make a difference? Hmm. Would that make a uh, I'll try to measure it, but I doubt it. Um. Yeah. Uh, we've uh, just on that we've cheated in some point. If you don't need them exact, just don't use atomic variables, and you get something that's kind of approximate. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> kinda, but uh, the two things we find uh, it, that at least on the X3 that is blocking is concurrent direct I/O writes uh, to the same file uh, and, and hitting contention on that, and everything pausing whenever anything runs sync, uh, which means you know transactional database systems we do that. Uh, so you, yeah, that, that, that's the big thing. Is yeah, then we're still working on those. <laughs> Since in networking we always have the same stats problem, have you looked into per CPU stats for, especially if it's per file system? Uh, I did look at per CPU stats. We're, we are actually using per CPU stats uh, for some things. Uh, the problem is per CPU stats can actually be quite heavyweight. Um, they, they can end up taking up a huge amount of space, and so we, we think hard before deciding whether or not we want, want the stats at all. Yeah. People who did the IPv6 SNMP MIB decided that it was wonderful to have three copies of every stat in <laughs> per CPU. <laughs> hey, memory's cheap, right? Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> per CPU also hurts when you've got 4,000 of them. Um, <laughs> the other way, the other obnoxious point is improving X4 is wonderful, but if I'm building a system, why shouldn't I just go XFS if they are also improving performance and starting out from 
a different position that might, that's probably better. Yeah, I, there, there's definitely things where XFS is still going to be much better than EXT4. Uh, for RAID systems in particular, they have a bunch of optimizations that aren't in EXT4. Um, one, one of the things I'm finding is that there are certain applications where EXT4 is still better, either because the tools are, a bit, are still a bit more advanced. Uh, inside Google, we're using them because uh, we can actually turn off the journal. Right? We're keeping multiple copies of, of our data files around for redundancy in case a disk dies or a server dies. Um, and it turns out the journal is just simply overhead that we don't need given everything else that we have to actually ensure uh, consistency at the cluster file system level. Um, so we're actually using ext4 with the journal disabled. Um, and that's something that you can't really do with XFS or, say, ButterFS, right, which is always going to be doing copy on write allocations whether or not you need, the, need it. Um, so it, it's going to vary, right? I think a lot of people will also decide that they don't actually need the file system bandwidth and they're familiar with ext4 and they understand it and so they use it for that reason. Um, there are lots of different reasons people choose file systems uh, and I don't want to say that any one of them is right or wrong. Uh, if you have a file system workload that uses RAID and really needs the I.O. bandwidth, F XFS might really be the right solution for you. Uh, have you found the Nick Piggins VFS scalability changes? Have, uh, do they help you much on these benchmarks? Uh, for the benchmarks that we were doing here, Thanks for mentioning Nick. That was actually one of the things I was going to do and, and forgot to. Uh, there's lots of other uh, scalability work that started up in the last year, one of which is Nick Piggins' um, scalability work at the VFS layer. Uh, the benchmarks that we were actually doing here were using FFSB, which is the Flexible File System Benchmark, um, and we're not really stressing metadata-intensive operations. Um, so the, a lot of this stuff got kicked off uh, by the real-time team because they were noticing dbench was hurting really, really badly. Um, once we fixed that one lock, at that, uh, at that point, all of the problems they were seeing were problems that needed to be addressed using Nix patches. Um, and so that probably would have been the end of the story, except that Eric Whitney fr from HP kind of popped out of the woodwork and started feeding me benchmark numbers. Um, and it was when I saw the benchmark numbers that I saw what work we still needed to do and could actually do it. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why I wanted to give this talk was to really point out to people why having a good benchmarking team, or in this case one good benchmarking person, in some ways is, it's just as important as the developer. Because without that, the developer is kind of blind. right? And you know he knows the tools, he could do it really quickly, and then once he gave me the tools, the amount of time that I spent writing these patches were actually pretty small compared to the amount of time Eric was doing to actually do the benchmark numbers. Any more questions? I'll take that for a no. Right. We'll put our hands together. Thank for you. Them.